there, this is Jed Schlackman. In this video I'd like to share a little bit about the topic of relationships, focusing primarily on intimate or romantic relationships. These are relationships in our lives that often tend to bring up some of our deepest fears and insecurities. It's kind of almost a cliche that in this type of relationship people will often project into that relationship issues that they've carried from their childhood or family of origin, issues of abandonment, abuse or neglect, feelings of rejection, and so on. So it's helpful to recognize when these issues are coming up, when your own unresolved emotional issues or issues pertaining to your self-worth or your identity are being expressed or manifested in the context of this type of intimate partnership. So for this talk I'm going to go over 10 questions that you can ask yourself about your intimate partnerships and romantic relationships so that you can build more self-awareness and perhaps see things from a pers um, an expanded perspective, a perspective that goes beyond those ego-based insecurities that may be dominating the way you react in your relationship. So let's proceed to go through these questions now and consider how they can help you develop more self-awareness and be more conscious and mindful in your relationships, seeing the role the relationship is playing in your life and whether it's a healthy or dysfunctional relationship and if there are things that you can do from your position to help shift that. The first question is, do my partner and I have enough shared values and ideals for our lives that would lead us to support one another rather than conflict with or interfere with one another. If you're building a partnership of any kind, it means you're collaborating with someone, so you would need to have some things in common that you're working together on. If you have a business partnership, you and your business partner would have shared goals relative to that business and its success and how it operates. So in a romantic relationship, those values or visions or priorities that you have might relate to your lifestyle, to having children and raising children. It might include your views about money, about sex, about your job or career, about your faith or religion. These are all significant issues that would be helpful to discuss to see how much common ground you have with your partner, to see if you have enough shared values or enough of a shared vision to work collaboratively in this partnership as a couple. The second question, if this were a person that I had no sexual attraction toward or sexual interest in, would I want to be close friends with and cohabit with the person? It's helpful to realize that as human beings, there's multiple aspects to our being. Some of our motivations or desires are based really on some very primal biological instincts. We're naturally inclined to seek to mate, to have sexual activities with a partner. From the species or biological perspective, this is necessary to help the species survive, to fuel procreation. And when we have these particular desires, the sexual attractions, 
we tend to connect that in our mind or our consciousness with attachment bonding with the emotional aspect of our being where we seek to have companionship to belong to this family or partnership to have someone who gives us some validation so we want to be conscious of what role each of these aspects are playing in terms of who we're choosing to have a relationship with and whether that's for our greater interest or not. So it is common for people to have a relationship that's based a lot on the sexual chemistry or sexual compatibility and because the partners have that between them that develops a certain amount of bond that they're afraid to let go of. They'll hold on to that fulfillment on the physical, sensual level, even if other aspects of their relationship really aren't working out well, if the partners really aren't so compatible in other ways. The third question, are either or both of us, both of you, dependent upon one another to meet emotional needs or material needs? So this goes to the subject of dependency where the partner in the relationship is in some way fulfilling or meeting a particular need the person feels they have. So there may be some emotional need, some practical material need that the person is helping fulfill. And we want to be aware of that when that's occurring in a relationship. It's not that this is good or bad or right or wrong, but it does often play a very significant role in the relationship and the way that partnership develops between this, those two individuals. One common pattern is financial dependency, where there's a person in the relationship who is supporting their partner in that sense. So they're the breadwinner, so to speak, in the relationship. So if that relationship dissolved, then the partner, the other person in the relationship, would not have that support. They wouldn't have that safety or security provided to them. And that could play a significant role in the decision of whether someone chooses to be in a relationship or not. There are also the emotional forms of validation or support that come from a relationship. Even just the fact that you're in a relationship and not alone can bring some sense of security or it could provide some form of positive social feedback so other people might look at you in a more positive way if you have a partner, if you're not single and alone. The next question, does the partner rescue you or you rescue your partner from things such as financial distress or from feeling lonely or abandoned? So this question is kind of like a follow-up on the previous one. Is someone playing a rescuer role in the relationship? If you find that you're always feeling depressed or sad or anxious or uneasy if your partner's not present or not around, and then when they come there to give you their attention and support, you feel okay then in a sense they are playing sort of a rescuing role. They're helping you pull yourself out of that unpleasant emotional state. Be aware of this because this is in a sense something that brings you a great vulnerability where if that person were to leave you to break off the relationship 
then you would have to deal with your feelings, your emotions, your insecurities, and so on. So you don't want to use that other person as sort of a band-aid or security blanket to help you avoid facing your own unresolved emotional issues. The next question, how complete or intense a bond do you believe couples should have? In cultures and societies, there can be a wide range of ideas and perspectives about what an ideal relationship would look like, how the partners would function in that relationship. In some cultures and some families, in some contexts, it's believed that the people who are in the relationship should be very tightly bonded to each other, where their lives very much revolve around one another. They spend a lot of time together, and they don't spend as much independent time or time involved in other social interactions, other social relationships or personal pursuits that don't involve the partner. Whereas there are some people who have partnerships where there's really very little closeness. The partnership might not be that very deeply intertwined emotional bond. It may be a marriage that's based more on some sort of social custom or convenience, on just having someone there to help with raising the children. So there are many different concepts people have about what a marriage is, what roles the partners play, how things should function or operate in that relationship. And if things are functioning and working to the satisfaction of each partner, then each of them may feel okay in that relationship. However, if one person has a concept or idea of how a relationship should function, and the other partner has a much different concept or idea of that, then there is likely to be some type of conflict or discord. The next question is, how exclusive do you believe your relationship should be, both emotionally and sexually? In our Western society that's been influenced a lot by the Judeo-Christian tradition, it's been quite common for people to have this strong concept of marriage being something very sacred and exclusive, where you definitely don't have any other sexual partners once you're in this committed relationship, and you may even restrict or limit some forms of social interactions with other people, especially if it's a heterosexual partnership. Of course, there are cultures and societies where relationships are seen in a more open way, whether this is something explicit or implicit. It's often a feature of certain cultures or societies. So if everyone involved agrees with those views of how exclusive a relationship should be, they may be able to get along with things functioning in a particular way. But again, if one person expects things to be very exclusive to have that particular ideal for their partnership, and the other person doesn't have that view of it, then there's likely to be some challenges, some stress upon that relationship. The next question you could ask yourself is how special do you and your partner perceive one another to be? Do you put each other on unrealistic pedestals or believe that there is a special someone in life that you are meant to find, and perhaps you may fear that if this person isn't 
quote unquote the one, then it would be hard to find whoever does fit that mental construct you have. As we go through life, we're often kind of programmed or conditioned to have this ideal, this view of finding a soulmate, that one special person who's ideal for us, who is the best possible partner. We have an ego in a sense that likes to see or think that whoever it has chosen as its partner, as someone to couple with, is the best person there is. And in a way it's perhaps useful or valuable to treat your partner in that way, to treat them as, as if they're wonderful and special and the best possible partner you could have. So for you to feel about them that way and to treat them as if you feel that way can help foster a very positive relationship. However, when we become sort of overly idealistic in that sense, we can be easily disappointed when the other person doesn't live up to our view of them, when they show their limitations, their weaknesses, their vulnerabilities, their, in a sense, flaws or weaknesses that are just part of being human, that no one can be an ideal of perfection. So if we have too much of that idea of the other person and then they don't live up to it, we might become overly reactive about that, overly judgmental, so too quick to tear them down from the pedestal and to react to them in a negative way. So if we have more of a balance in this regard, it could help us address or deal with things in the relationship in a healthier and more constructive way. The next question is, where do your beliefs and expectations about romance and relationships come from? Are they from your own family, from peer culture, from religion, from books, from media, from societal traditions or other sources. Typically it's a combination of these influences, but this kind of happens we, that we pick up these imprints or programs in our consciousness without thinking a lot about it. So we tend to carry forward these beliefs without really re-examining or questioning them too much. And we tend to view them as kind of objectively true or valid since we want to think of ourselves as correct or right of having a good understanding of relationships and what we should be looking for or expecting in a relationship even though this is really something very subjective. So whatever you value, whatever you see as a priority in a relationship, that is your personal values and priorities. It's not something that needs to be the same for everyone. It's not something that the whole world should agree upon or all see the same way. So be aware of what has influenced your views and beliefs, your expectations about relationships, but come to this understanding that no one has the absolute truth or an objective truth about how relationships should be. The next question which is more stressful or uncomfortable to you? Is it being in a romantic relationship or not being in a romantic relationship? 
Are you either avoiding relationships or avoiding leaving a relationship to avoid experiencing what you perceive as something distressing? So keep in mind that we carry within us unresolved emotions from our past experiences. It could be from other relationships we've had as an adult. It could be from our childhood attachments. It could be from our quote-unquote past lives or other incarnations or even the patterns of experience that our parents or other ancestors had which we have somehow embodied within our own consciousness. So let's consider that if you're avoiding a relationship, if you're finding it more easy and comfortable to just be by yourself, this could be due to past experiences in relationships where you felt heartbroken, where you felt betrayed or abandoned, where you suffered some significant emotional pain, and you prefer not to have a potential or risk of experiencing that again, so you're taking the way out of not letting yourself be open or vulnerable to pursue relationships. Another possibility is that you're seeking to avoid separation from a relationship because from past experiences you had pain of being left alone or abandoned, of being left without a partner. And so in that scenario, you're seeking to cling to a relationship to avoid the pain of being without a partner, of being on your own. So those are a couple of common patterns that we see in society, ways people deal with relationships. And there are other patterns, common themes that we can find as we look through different intimate relationships and how people respond and react to them, how people communicate with each other and treat one another in their intimate partnerships. These different questions that I've posed here would apply whether your relationship is heterosexual or homosexual or bisexual. So the sexual orientation isn't really the concern here. It's more of these deeper emotional issues about ourself and how we view relationships that concern or influence how we react and respond in these relationships. I hope that this talk has given each of you some things to think about, to consider or ponder, especially if you're having some challenges in your relationships, if you're having some insecurities within yourself and how you function in relationships. Relationships are certainly a major aspect of our life. They are an opportunity for us to explore what our values are, our visions in life, also to explore how we feel about ourselves how we respond to the way other people connect with us, how other people communicate with us or treat us. There are many different issues and aspects of relationships that you could examine. This talk just briefly touches on a handful of them. For those that are interested in exploring personal growth and development, in exploring spirituality, holistic health, and wellness. I invite you to watch some more of my YouTube videos. You can also visit my website, phinsights.com. That's P-H-I-N 
S-I-G-H-T-S dot C-O-M. For now, I'd like to wish each of you a wonderful day. Namaste.